Tonight on Bridge City News, a new support service is now available for those who have been affected by sexual violence. Alberta's One Line is now online. We will explain. Stolen pets is becoming a major issue in our province. We will explain the best way to protect your dog from being taken. And another blow to the Trudeau Liberals as the Green Party wins a seat in British Columbia. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Good evening. Thanks so much for joining us. The Chinook Sexual Assault Centre in Lethbridge offers counselling, crisis support, court support and advocacy for victims of all genders and ages. The province has now added additional support in the form of a helpline. People can simply dial 1-866-403-8000 seven days a week from 9am till 9pm. CEO of the Chinook Sexual Assault Centre, Christine Cassie, says this line offers an alternative to face-to-face -face support which can be difficult for victims. Trust is a major issue and so they want to test out the waters a bit. This is a good way to do it is to make that call even if it's anonymous and to talk about what your situation is and to see where that next step can be for you to, to start your he healing. So our city is very fortunate to have a sexual assault center. There's other services um, that also exist in areas where sexual assault centers aren't yet established. Uh, so the importance of that is to know where you might be able to go to get counseling. Who else might be able to act as a support in your community for what you're going through? And so from the line, they can actually be directed and given a warm transfer to some of these services, including sexual assault centers across the province. So again, we increase the capacity to be able to provide services to every victim in the province. The helpline is able to translate over 200 languages, including Cree. Mental health is on the minds of Canadians all week long. The Canadian Mental Health Association took to social media to promote an awareness campaign, and this year's campaign theme is Get Loud about what mental health really is. So we know that one in five Canadians at some point in their life will have a mental illness, but we also know that five in five Canadians have mental health, and mental health we can take care of in a number of different ways. Sometimes it's something as simple as going and connecting with nature, going out and checking out what's going on in our community, places like Helen Schuler, Round Table Board Gamery, the public library are great, great places to go and relax and take care of your mental health. We have a number of crisis services also that do come into play if people are experiencing a crisis, say they have a bad day, say they just need somebody to talk to. We all always have a 24-7 distress line available here in Lethbridge. As part of the campaign, the CMHA wants people to understand mental illness is everyone's issue. For more information, you can visit their website at mentalhealthweek.ca. Around 150 students were immersed into the Lethbridge College experience this week. As Jeanette Rocher explains, high schoolers are discovering that there's a lot more to the college life than meets the eye. Teenagers hanging from the rafters, literally. These high school students are learning that it takes getting over a fear of heights in order to work in the wind turbine technician industry. Uh, no, it wasn't that scary. I felt safe with the safety equipment. Uh, besides that, I just had to jump, I guess. <laughs> it wasn't too bad. The newest ones that are coming in in southern Alberta are going to be 135 meters tall. This one inside is about 25 feet, and we have a 60, a 70 foot one outside that we train on outside. The wind turbine course is just one of the many programs offered during Lethbridge College's Experiential Learning Week. It's a way for students to spend a week immersing themselves in different programs. So we have 13 different schools from across southern Alberta, just over 130 students here with the 10 different program areas offered by LC. In addition to that, more than 80 students are staying on residence. Over the last four years, there's been a lot of different developments in it. So it was actually began by regional stewardship here at the college, and it was offered to schools that had a regional stewardship campus. So it started out quite small and has expanded year by year. This is actually the first year that recruitment has taken it on. So we're really excited to be offering it. Um, we're hoping to grow it even further, hoping to invite local schools next year, expand on it. Um, but it's definitely grown and changed a lot since it began. The hope is that this program will help them reach for the stars and give them the tools they need to succeed to climb the ladder of success. For Bridge City News, I'm Jeanette Roche. It is a dog owner's worst nightmare, having your pet stolen. Recent reports say dog napping is on the rise across the province. Animal welfare organizations say many times it's due to underground fighting rings. Alberta's pet detective tells you how you can keep your pets safe and from being stolen. You also have to be very aware of the different kinds of dangers that are out there. One of the dangers that seems to be a high priority right now is dog theft. Dogs are being taken out of your people's backyards. Um, it seems that not just purebred are being targeted. 
all types of dogs, large and small, are being taken. Some are being lured off properties, while others are really being taken out of their own yards. Um, another, some of the reasons why these people are taking these dogs, unfortunately, some are going into dog fighting. We're not recovering the bodies, and it just doesn't add up. These animals are going somewhere. So I would say a small portion is going into this nightmare of dog fighting. Um, backyard breeders are a real big problem. Alberta, Saskatchewan, BC, and in fact, straight across Canada, or probably around the world, um, backyard breeders can make a lot of money off of your dog. If you're on Facebook and you're proudly showing your puppy that you got and you're advertising that, you know, she's a purebred, she's worth $2,500, we're having her spayed next week, you've just targeted your animal. Taylor says to never give up on your lost or stolen dog. Animals have instincts to survive in the wild, even in the winter, whether you have a three-pound chihuahua or a 140-pound Great Dane. This is Alberta Forest Week. There are currently 40,000 Albertans who work either directly in or jobs that exist as a result of forestry. Our province's new forestry and agriculture minister, Devin Dreeshen, says last year countries including the United States, Japan, China, and the EU purchased more than $4.1 billion of Alberta forest products. Dreeshen says this week is not only important to celebrate those who work in the industry, but it is also a week of tree planting, education and wildfire prevention and suppression, and managing the mountain pine beetle population. Police in Calgary say a 50-year-old woman has been charged in the death of a man. Police say they were called to a home in the city's northeast last week for a report of an assault. The man in his 40s was later pronounced dead at the scene. Roberta Lynn Wolfchild has been charged with second-degree murder. She appeared in court yesterday. Investigators say they will not release the identity of the victim until an autopsy has been performed. Last night, voters in the federal riding of Nanaimo Ladysmith elected Paul Manley of the Green Party as the new MP. He took away the seat from the NDP, and the result left the Liberals a distant fourth. The Greens now hold two seats in the House of Commons. Manley says his party is brimming with confidence heading into the fall election. It's a very historic win, and I think it's, it's awesome for uh, the Green Party right across Canada, and it's, uh, uh, it's great for Nanaimo Ladysmith. Well, I think, it's, it, I think it's, it sends a message, you know, clearly. We've seen a wave come across from PEI, and this is sending a wave back across Canada that people are serious about climate change. They're serious about taking better care of people, We're putting people in the planet before profits, and that's what the Green Party policies are all about. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau reacted to the Greens' win and says the result proves more Canadians are concerned about climate change. He even took the opportunity to take a few shots at Conservative Premiers. One of the clear things that we've seen from, uh, from this, uh, this by-election, and I want to congratulate all the candidates who, who ran in it, is that Canadians are really preoccupied about climate change. Uh, I think as we see the rise of uh, successful Conservative politicians at the Premier level right across the country who don't believe in taking climate action, it's going to be really, really important that Canadians pick a government this fall that is committed to climate action, and that's certainly the point we're going to be making throughout the fall. The Mark Norman saga was back in the House of Commons. The Liberals faced questions about political games in the case against the military's one-time second-in-command. There are reports that retiring Liberal MP Andrew Leslie will testify against the Liberal government. Mark Norman is a man of integrity who has served our country with distinction in the Royal Canadian Navy. Yeah. But the Liberals seem to have a personal vendetta against the Vice Admiral and are going out of their way to block evidence and deny him a fair trial. Thankfully, there is a Liberal who has had enough of the Prime Minister's lack of integrity. The Liberal member for Orleans is going to testify on Norman's behalf. Will the Prime Minister stop this obstruction and release all of the relevant documents immediately? I can report to the Honourable Member that the, the Department of Justice has cooperated uh, and given all appropriate documents uh, to, the, uh, to the trial in question, and we continue to collaborate on an ongoing basis uh, in order to make sure that all sides in the, in the trial have the information that they are entitled to. With G7 Environment Ministers meeting in France, NDP leader Jagmeet Singh took his first chance during question period to ask the Liberals when they will cut fossil fuel subsidies. The Prime Minister promised Canadians that he would do better. But instead, Liberals have dithered over semantics, delayed action, and continued to give billions in dollars in subsidies to fossil fuel corporations. 
When will liberals finally stop handing out billions in fossil fuel subsidies and instead invest that money into helping Canadians build a new, clean economy? By taking action to fight climate change, we certainly will protect the health and, uh, of our economy and create good jobs for the future. We stand by our commitment with our international partners to phase out inefficient, non-tax fossil fuel subsidies by 2025. We've done a bunch of the work in that regard. We continue to do that going forward. We've opened up a consultation with Canadians to move that forward and we intend to meet our international obligations. One of the stories we recently had was how Israel was under attack from Hamas and Gaza. More than 700 rockets were launched over the past few days, leaving many people dead and scores of others injured. Our foreign affairs expert Lisa Daftari says more needs to be done to help Israel. She says it all starts with the United Nations, which needs to do more. You know, it's quantifiable how awful the bias is at the UN against Israel. You have 20 resolutions in one year, this is only one year, 20 resolutions were written up about the state of Israel and a total of six for all other countries across the world. I mean, they have, or they've assigned countries like Saudi Arabia and the Iranian regime to the Women's Rights Committee, and yet day in and day out, they call out Israel for, for, for what? Uh, in a country where gays have prospered, Christians have prospered, Muslims and Jews live side by side, a country where, you know, you have everything, women's rights. I mean, women outnumber men in many of the sectors and in the universities. But, you know, this is, um, as you said, never enough. Catch the full interview with our foreign affairs expert, Lisa Daftari, coming up in the second half of our show. The owner of the horse Maximum Security says he will not run his horse in the middle jewel of the Triple Crown and will appeal the disqualification as the Kentucky Derby winner. His horse was disqualified for what racing officials said was interference. Maximum Security became the first uh, horse in the Kentucky Derby to be disqualified after finishing first for interference. It culminated a hectic several months for the industry and has sparked a firestorm that has clouded the triple crown season for the sport. That's usually when everybody's paying attention to horse racing and this is not the attention that the sport and the industry had hoped for. This was not what they had hoped for heading into the Triple Crown season. It has left the sport in disarray and it, with no governing organization body to run it, it seems uncertain where it will end up. We know for certain that maximum security will not run in the Preakness and the Derby winner may not run in the Preakness, which means there will be no Triple Crown winner this year. Babies born in a San Francisco hospital were given tiny, hand-knitted golden crowns yesterday because they shared the same birthday as the newest member of the royal family. Okay, you can do this. I know, it's so cute. Our baby was born on the same day as Meghan and Prince Harry's baby. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one of the nurses crocheted this beautiful crown and um, uh, we're so lucky that he got born this day and gets to wear this crown. Yeah, show it off. It's kind of exciting to have that connection. I think he'll grow up enjoying learning that. Yeah. yeah. Probably a trip to London. Probably a trip to London is fitting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perhaps they can celebrate their birthdays together once they're maybe a little bit older. The farmers have been enjoying some of the moisture, but the rain clouds are moving on. I'll have a complete look at the weather picture in just a moment. We had light showers off and on today. Tonight, a chance of showers developing again with a low near minus one. Tomorrow, the rain clouds should clear up, bringing us a high near 13. Thursday, mainly sunny with a high of 18. Friday, warming up slightly to 20 degrees. A beautiful weekend is shaping up. Saturday, lots of sunshine and a balmy high of 26. Sunday, cooling off slightly to 19. Monday, a mixture of sun and cloud and a high near 17 degrees. Looking at the Almanac, the average high for this time of year is 17 and an average low of three. The highest temperature of this date was recorded in 1987 at 30 degrees, and the record low was minus six in 2000. Sunrise was at 559, sunset at 857. Looking at the national forecast for tomorrow now, Victoria will be mainly sunny in 22. Sunshine at 21 is on tap for Vancouver. A chance of showers in 14 for Calgary on Wednesday. Edmonton may also receive rain, but should see a high near 15. Sunshine and 11 is expected in Regina. Lots of sunshine at 13 for Saskatoon tomorrow. A slight chance of showers and 12 for Winnipeg. Just a few clouds and 12 as well for Toronto on Wednesday. Sunny and 12 for Ottawa. Mainly sunny and 14 for Montreal tomorrow. 
In the Maritimes, Fredericton, New Brunswick will have a mixture of sun and cloud and should see a high near 10. Halifax, Nova Scotia will have rain in 13. Charlottetown PEI will have light showers in 9. And in St. John's, Newfoundland, expect periods of drizzle in a high near 10 degrees tomorrow. In the months leading up to the Alberta provincial election, there was a lot of talk on improving our economy and supporting small businesses. Lethbridge is celebrating Economic Development Week, which is an international campaign focused on generating wealth for communities across the globe. A big part of their role should be working with local businesses, going out and having coffee with them and saying, hey, you know, what are your challenges? It, should we, uh, is, is it a physical thing within the, our community that we need to change? Is it policies? Is it procedures? Is it taxes? Is it, what, what is it that would help if we could make a change? What would help you be more successful as a business? What, are you looking for new markets? Are you looking for new products? What is it? So that's really... You know, if, if our economic developers are doing their jobs well, they're really focused on their local businesses and proud to be celebrating it this year because I really think Albertans are focused on jobs and the economy and what we can do to make this a better place for us and for our kids. And so I think, you know, it's such a golden opportunity for our organization to help highlight the work of economic developers because many of them, uh, you know, they just do their work and some people don't realize they're in their community. The City of Lethbridge recently announced the Board of Directors for the Economic Development Lethbridge with 25 members serving Lethbridge in unique ways. Two Canadian livestock genetic companies are seeing delays getting their export licenses to China renewed. The two are Alta Genetics in Balzac, located just north of Calgary, and the other is Semex, based in Guelph, Ontario. China's already suspended export permits for two Canadian pork companies and has halted canola imports from Canada. An executive with Canadian Beef Breeds Council says, however, it is not unusual to see delays when renewing permits for international trade. Michael Latimer says the issue may be under the microscope more due to the ongoing diplomatic problems between Canada and China. Alberta Premier Jason Kenney says his number one priority is to get more Albertans working, especially those in the energy sector. Trevor Toome is the Associate Professor of Economics at the University of Calgary. He says it'll take some time to turn our economy around. In an economy as large as Alberta's, it's really hard to move it up or down by dramatic amounts in the short term. For some perspective, Alberta produces about $2 billion worth of goods and services every single day. So you can't turn an economy that large on a dime. Government can certainly nudge it up or down, increase growth rates slightly or decrease them slightly through policy changes, but it, it, it will not see a rapid turnaround in what's kind of a lackluster recovery at the moment. Catch the full interview with Trevor Toome talking about the Alberta economy and our recovery coming up after business news. One analyst is calling WestJet's first quarter results mixed despite a 30% increase in profit over a year ago. The airline says it earned $45.6 million, or 40 cents per diluted share for the quarter, while revenue increased $1.26 billion from $1.19 billion. Analyst Doug Taylor says the airline had solid profits, but revenue per available seat mile was disappointing. He says it was well below that of Air Canada, as both airlines have been scrambling to adjust their schedules in the fallout from the grounding of Boeing 737's MAX 8 aircraft. Now, here's a look at today's markets. Recapping one of our top stories this hour, those who've been affected by sexual violence now have more support. Alberta's one line is accessible across the province. Victims, along with their friends and families affected by sexual violence, can now call 1-866-403-8000 seven days a week from 9 a.m. till 9 p.m. 
More than 700 rockets were launched into Israel and Gaza, leaving many dead and countless others injured. Will we ever see peace in the Middle East? Our foreign affairs expert, Lisa Daftari, gives us her thoughts next. But first, here's a look what's happening in and around your community. Here is your Bridge City News community calendar. Come and take part in the fourth annual Lakeview Community Superhero Fun Run, taking place Wednesday, May 8th at 6 p.m. at the Lakeview Elementary School Playground. This event features a two kilometer run or walk and a five kilometer run for all ages. Everyone is encouraged to dress up as their favorite superhero. The entry fee is $25 per person with proceeds from the race going to the Lakeview Outdoor Living Space. To register, visit racepro.ca slash Lakeview Run. The Troyanda Ukrainian Dance Club is presenting its annual year-end show, Vesna, a Ukrainian celebration of spring, on May 8th at 7 p.m. at the NMAC Center. See amazing dances and brightly colored costumes from various regions of Ukraine. Plus, dances from the Philippines and Sri Lanka will also be featured with special guest performers, the Filipino Salto Group and Lethbridge Lankins. Tickets are $15 for adults, $12 for students and seniors, and $5 for kids 12 and under. Tickets can be purchased at the Ticket Center by calling 403-329-7328 or go to nmaxcenter.ca. Do you have a passion for writing? The River Bottom Writers invite you to join them the second and fourth Thursday of every month at 6.45 p.m. in the Richardson Oilseed Room at Lethbridge College for a session of informal writing practice. All genre of writers are welcome. Bring your pen, paper, or laptop. And that's your Bridge City News Community Calendar. More than 700 rockets were fired on Israel from the Islamic Jihad Hamas. Close to 30 people have died as violence flares between Gaza and Israel. To tell us more about it is our foreign affairs expert, Lisa Daftari, joining me once again from Los Angeles. Lisa, this was the deadliest attack since, what, the War of 2014? Yes, we haven't seen a flare-up, even though we see um, these, you know, mini flare-ups quite often because the, uh, you know, Hamas and Islamic Jihad side is not subsiding. Uh, they have started back up again, and they're relentless. Uh, this is an all-out war. Uh, and, you know, this this would not be allowed, uh, you know, into any other sovereign nation on Earth without, you know, a, a an uproar, a, a massive and unified condemnation by the international community. But we're hearing crickets. And why is that? Why is that? Because it's Israel. I mean, why is there two sides to this story? Why is there a, you know, a, a type of, uh, they try to, or at least have some sort of moral equivalency to say, well, this many people died on the other side. Well, as uh, one of my friends said, we'll start hearing about this story because it's not really being reported in the media as soon as Israel starts retaliating. When Israel starts retaliating, then the media and the headlines start calling the story a different way, that there was a disproportionate response uh, that, you know, that, that X amount of Palestinians were killed, then we'll start seeing, you know, the PR job that the Palestinians do so well. But the truth of the matter is that uh, the Palestinians do deserve better, and they deserve better leadership. Uh, and that's because they are being mishandled and taken advantage of by Hamas, their leaders. Uh, and this is what they put their money into. Instead of, of developing and allowing the people of uh, the Palestinian people to prosper and to at least uh, grow out of this perpetual victimhood. They put money into missiles and into brainwashing young children to kill Jews and kill Jews and kill Jews. And how many generations of this are we going to have? And right next door, you have Israel, a country the size of New Jersey, where you have um, probably the world's foremost, uh, you know, um, advancements in, in all sectors of technology and water technology, irrigation and agriculture and cell phones and computers and, and everything else. So, um, you know, it, it's it's really disappointing to see this reaction by the world community. Of course, here in the United States, uh, they have condemned this uh, and from Washington, but you have other lawmakers, you know, the, the young congresswomen who uh, seems like they're working for Hamas. It's scary. It's scary that this opinion exists, that they're allowed to put it out there because we have freedom of speech um and that they have so many constituents following them and you now have a whole pool a large pool of democratic candidates here in the, in the united states that have been silent on this our biggest ally in the middle east lisa a recent report by the times israel says israeli defense forces says it also neutralized a cyber attack by the hamas terror group over the weekend 
Yeah, so it seems, you know, once they believe that the Israelis were in a place of vulnerability, which they should never assume as such, because, you know, the, the terror business in Israel never sleeps. You, They are on their toes 24-7. Uh, there was an, an attempted um, massive, very large scale uh, uh, attempt to, to shut down, you know, um, a, a large infrastructure with a cyber attack. Uh, and that was foiled and that was caught and it was stopped. But again, showing that this is a relentless all-out war to cripple Israel in whatever way possible, uh, whether it's cyber, whether it's war, you know, suicide bombings, whether it's you know, young children, nothing is off the table. Uh, again, it's, it's the culture of death uh, that they're dealing with, and um, they go back to uh, coming up with new schemes uh, as soon as the Israelis go back to living life. U.S. envoys are speaking out about the attacks in Israel, saying enough is enough. But if you were to ask Hamas, it's never enough. So what can be done to better protect Israel? Yeah, we wish we knew the answer to that. This has been almost age old since biblical times we've been dealing with this. And of course, since 1948, with the formal uh, establishment of the state of Israel. But since then, you know, you have this hypocrisy across the, the world. You know, this week I had actually the, the huge honor of uh, interviewing um, former ambassador to the UN, uh, Nikki Haley, on stage at a, a gala here in Los Angeles. And, uh, you know, one of her major, major roles at the UN was to bring justice regarding Israel. Uh, and she has always said, you know, it's quantifiable how awful the bias is at the UN against Israel. You have 20 resolutions in one year, this is only one year, 20 resolutions were written up about the state of Israel and a total of six for all other countries across the world. I mean, they have, or they've assigned countries like Saudi Arabia and the Iranian regime to the Women's Rights Committee, and yet day in and day out, they call out Israel for, for, for what? Uh, in a country where gays have prospered, Christians have prospered, Muslims and Jews live side by side, a country where, you know, you have everything, women's rights. I mean, women outnumber men in many of the sectors and in the universities. But, you know, this is, um, as you said, never enough. It's never enough until they, they actually push Israel into the sea, which is what they say they want to do. Trade talks between the United States and China are not going well. In fact, U.S. President Donald Trump says the tariffs on $200 billion of Chinese goods will be increasing 25 percent. Trump's not happy with the slow trade talks. No, but just the announcement that he will increase these tariffs by 25 percent come the end of this week has sent the markets into a frenzy. People are very upset at what this will bring, how prices will be affected, uh, on common goods that we, we import in here into the United States. I know Canada has a similar issue. Uh, but in the interim, this is I, what I believe is, is President Trump's calculation, that in the interim we will all suffer, but China will suffer most. Uh, and that will give us the leverage we need to bring them back to the negotiating table, but in a way that will push this deal forward more quickly. What Trump is upset about is the slow pace at which uh, progress is being made with the Chinese. Now, I spoke to a source last night uh, who is in touch with many uh, Chinese businessmen, many wealthy Chinese companies, banks uh, on the ground in China. And he said things are not looking good in China, meaning whatever is being done is actually affecting the Chinese economy. And that is uh, perhaps the goal here, to cripple the economy, to bring them to their knees and to bring them to the table to negotiate a deal that will be favorable to the West and, and mostly, of course, the United States. Remember, President Trump, back then, candidate Trump, before then, just a businessman from New York City, always talked about how China is taking advantage of the United States and how he wanted to put a stop to that. Uh, and I guess this is the roadmap that he's taking. It's a bit painful and a bumpy road to get there, but this is his plan. Yeah, stock futures, as you mentioned, they sunk on Trump's uh, trade tweets. Even the stocks in Australia declined as trade tensions were heightened between the U.S. and China. This really goes to show how connected we are economically around the world, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And what a footprint China has left uh, on the international market, which again goes to echo the, the point that 
uh, China has been taking advantage of a free trade, free market. Uh, and now it's time that they play by the rules. I mean, it's wonderful that you see, you know, businessmen in China that used to ride their bikes and now they ride Ferraris, uh, that they have become so wealthy so quickly uh, because of free trade. And again, uh, you know, Donald Trump's point is that, well, that's fine, but you got to play by the rules if you're going to play with us. And we're letting you in on this huge opportunity to trade with us. Uh, and yes, it affects us all, particularly the NAFTA countries, which are no longer called the NAFTA countries. But we are always uh, going to be united in trade. And of course, whatever affects the United States will affect Mexico and Canada likewise. You know, it's interesting. Growing up as a kid, I looked at all the toys I had, a lot of the products I had made in China. You know, for, for many, many years, it was like that here in Canada. Now, the Canadian economy is not humming like it once was. And here in Alberta, we're trying to dig ourselves out of a recession with our energy sector. The economy of the United States, however, south of the border where you are, is still doing quite well. Yes, and I think that that is what Donald Trump is, is quite happy about. The jobs numbers are really uh, good. Uh, unemployment numbers are good and the economy numbers are good. So um, this, of course, helps uh, Donald Trump's approval numbers. Uh, it helps with the, uh, as they call it, the, the Goldilocks economy that we have. The stock market was actually doing pretty decently. Uh, mortgage rates are, are low and steady. They weren't raised last week, uh, which many were fearful of. So, you know, things are, are holding pretty steadily, although the mainstream media might paint a very different picture of all of the um, you know, e economic help that that uh, or Donald Trump has, has, has had had or success, I should say, economic success that he has had. Um, but all eyes are on this China deal. And I think once uh, and when he is able to push something um, pro-America through, then he can really tout making some major, major strides in the U.S. economy in his first term. Trump is imposing new sanctions against Iran. Apparently, his next moves will be to tank the reigning economy. Tell me more about that. Yeah, so, uh, of course, it's been a year already since uh, Donald Trump pulled out of the Iran nuclear deal. Exactly a year. Uh, and, you know, I think the, the goal since then was, well, we're not going to just give out freebies to the Iranian regime when they're not playing by the rules. What we're going to do is uh, sanction the heck out of them. And these sanctions are going to be targeted sanctions, meaning it's going to be more difficult, although impossible to to really make this, um, you know, immune to the Iranian people. The, the point is not for it to trickle down into mainstream economy, although it will. Um, and, you know, the regime has a way of passing along that economic burden of sanctions onto the people of Iran and saying, well, it's the big Satan that did this. It's America that did this. And, you know, having uh, the Iranians rally around the flag, that's not what we want. What we do want uh, is a different, different formula. Uh, it's to cripple the Iranian economy to the point that it brings people out onto the streets. Perhaps it's something like a 2009 Green Revolution where you have people so disenchanted with the government that that internal strife is pretty much the Achilles heel of the regime. That, in turn, is, is much more fearful for the Iranian uh, rulers than any uh, Trump or uh, European Union could ever be. So uh, the goal here is to cripple the economy from the inside with, with uh, oil sales, with the central bank, for them not to be able to collect money, uh, and to cripple the economy in a way that hopefully affects the regime more than anyone else, so that they could stop pouring money into terrorism projects like into Hamas in Gaza and Hezbollah in Lebanon and Syria and Yemen and Iraq, and the list goes on and on. So this is to, again, cause behavioral change from the regime from the inside out. And uh, we hope that these targeted sanctions uh, continue to do that, that what, what, which that they've been doing, which is really suffocating the Iranian regime to a point where they, they have to turn over a new leaf. The troubles continue in Venezuela. Depends who you speak with, if what took place was actually a coup. Opposition leader Juan Guaido says he will consider U.S. military intervention. And U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says, Lisa, it is a possibility. Well, in the case of Venezuela, what the U.S. has attempted to do is to not go too hard, but to go hard enough. And with that, they will leave the statement of all options are on the table. We've heard that before. We actually heard it with the Iranian regime. We heard it with Syria until it was too late because we didn't do anything about the red line that was drawn, etc. But this is a, a very common foreign policy play that the U.S. makes. All options are on the table. 
In the case of Guaido, he's from the United States. He has connections within the White House. Um, of course, he's going to listen to whatever you know is is told to him, and and is is basically he's directed to do. Um, he's not exactly a puppet of the United States, but he might as well be because that's where his major s source of support is. Uh, when you look at the situation, you know you have an opposition leader. Um, which in many cases, when you have some sort of coup or revolution, you don't have that kind of opposition leader. But in this case, since we do have an opposition leader, there's a better chance that this could be a successful turnaround or turnover, um, especially since the people of Venezuela want Maduro to go, the neighbors want Maduro to go, most of the international community want Maduro to go, who wants him to stay? All the bad actors. Everyone who wants to stick a finger in the eye of the United States wants them to stay. So the list goes something like China, North Korea, Russia, Iran, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's where we are with Venezuela another day. And um, although the protests are getting, you know, they're fizzling out a bit, I think that sentiment will still stick around for a while. Lisa, many people today use their debit cards instead of cash. I knew I do a lot of times myself. In Sweden last year, apparently only 13% of Swedes remembered using cash for a purchase. There is talk now that Sweden will be going completely cashless? Yes, it's very interesting. You know, many years ago, my mother made this prediction that the whole world would go cashless, and we thought it was such a weird concept that my mother's, that this, years and years ago. Uh, now, uh, you know, when you see these numbers, I'm wondering if Americans even, you know, you see people pulling out a credit card for a cup of coffee or a pack of gum. Uh, who's using cash? You usually, I mean, you don't see cash as often anymore. Um, so, you know, Sweden is, a, I guess, a case study for some. Um, when people are not using cash, why even have it? Why have places that, you know, have to deal with that? Let everything be um, credit. I know there are co coffee shops uh, in the United States that only take credit card. There's some restaurants that only take credit card. I think maybe for them it's a safer process. Um, it's better for bookkeeping. It's better for, you know, there's less of chance of fraud and embezzlement and um, theft. Uh, and the list goes on. So, it's an interesting concept. It's weird, uh, you know, having grown up in, in a very, very different times. Uh, but we'll see what happens in Sweden. The vaccination debate rages on, not just here in North America, but in Europe as well. Now Germany is considering fining parents just over $2,700 if they do not vaccinate their kids. Oh, uh, Hal, this is a very, very touchy subject for me. It really, it's, it's, it's hurtful. It's hurtful to see parents be so short-sighted not to vaccinate their children, uh, to send them out into society and uh, make other people sick. I mean, um, there's so many stories here in the United States of innocent people who are now in comas because they got the measles because of unvaccinated. I mean, and this goes on in, in different communities, whether it's the celebrities who believe that their kids will get autism if they're, and this is unproven, um, or, you know, you have certain uh, highly, highly uh, secluded uh, communities where they don't believe in vaccination. Uh, and again, if you don't believe in vaccination, you should stay secluded. You should sequester yourself from the rest of society so that people are not at risk um, the way that it is now. This is probably the biggest outbreak since it was basically cleared um, about, I think, two decades ago. Um, and here we are dealing with this again. Uh, it's very short-sighted and, and, and quite sad. We had a situation here very close to where I live uh, at UCLA um, where they had to, to basically quarantine an entire lecture hall of 300 people because they believed someone in there had it and perhaps could have spread to others in that lecture hall. But again, awful and very short-sighted. Our foreign affairs expert, Lisa Daftari, joining me once again from Los Angeles. Thanks, Lisa. My pleasure. The provincial election is all over and Alberta has a brand new government. Now time will tell as to whether or not the economy actually turns around and the debt starts to shrink. Joining me now to discuss this is Dr. Trevor Toome, Associate Professor of Economics at the University of Calgary. He recently wrote an interesting article for the Globe and Mail called Coming Soon, Jason Kenney's Economic Reality Check. Trevor, welcome to Bridge City News. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Now as you point out, the hard work now begins. Albertans want to change. But in reality, it's not going to happen overnight, is it? No, I think we should temper our expectations. In an economy as large as Alberta's, it's really hard to move it up or down by dramatic amounts in the short term. For some perspective, Alberta produces about $2 billion worth of goods and services every single day. So you can't turn an economy that large 
on a dime. Government can certainly nudge it up or down, increase growth rates slightly or decrease them slightly through policy changes, but it, it, it will not see a rapid turnaround in what's kind of a lackluster recovery at the moment. So why don't we start talking a bit about the uh, carbon tax, a contentious issue at the recent provincial election. Now, how is it even possible considering, you know, to get rid of the, uh, the carbon tax? It's a federal tax, and especially what happened recently in Saskatchewan, where judges voted 3-2 in favor of the levy. That, that's right. So carbon taxes in Alberta certainly were a defining issue in the campaign, and no doubt they are a controversial policy, absolutely. Um, how removing the carbon tax in Alberta will affect the economy sort of depends. I think first we need to remember that if the provincial government, or sorry, not if, when the provincial government removes the Alberta carbon tax, the federal one is going to then come in potentially a few weeks after that. There is a difference between these two programs, however. The federal uh, carbon tax plan takes 90% of those dollars that it raises and sends it right back to individual households as kind of lump sum checks. So for Alberta households, there may be an improvement overall in their bottom lines because the current Alberta carbon tax uh, only about 40% of those dollars are sent back to households and it's done in a non-universal kind of targeted way. So I think many Albertans are going to see an improvement in their household budgets just from this switch to the federal plan. But then we have to wait until the fall October election to see what happens with the federal carbon tax. Yeah, especially with the blue wave making its way in all of the provinces across the country right now. Now the UCP will be putting a freeze on spending. Some argue that's going a little too far how much of a difference will this freeze actually make? So that, that's an interesting point. The UCP fiscal plan that they brought out in the campaign aims to balance the budget by 2022. So it's going to be balancing over the next three years. It will be losing some revenues because without carbon tax revenue coming in, there's going to be a reduction in Alberta government revenue. They're also planning to lower the corporate income tax, for example. So a slight drop in revenues and it's that freeze in spending that allows them to balance by 2022. That will require some hard choices because Alberta is a growing province. Every year we have one, one and a half percent increase in our population. That increases the demand on public services. Prices increase by about 2% or so each year. So to maintain that freeze will require a good deal of effort, I'd say, on the part of government. And that'll be something to watch over the coming years. But in broad strokes, it is a credible timeline to balance by 2022. If Alberta manages to get back to a balanced budget within four years, where would we be at? I mean, when we're looking at our overall debt at that point. Yeah, that's a great question. So balancing the budget doesn't mean that we will stop accumulating debt. So picture ourselves in 2022 and we successfully balance the budget that year with a modest surplus. That doesn't mean debt will stop growing because there still will be that year borrowing for infrastructure and capital projects that are not expensed in the usual way. So beyond 2022, there will still be a fiscal challenge that the province needs to tackle. And then over the longer term, our population is aging, healthcare costs will be rising here like elsewhere, and the pace of growth and royalty revenues will begin to slow. So balancing by 2022 is roughly speaking about half of the longer term fiscal uh, challenges that the province faces. And yes, costs can consid considerably rise all the time. Uh, there will be schools and hospitals that need to be built and our seniors population continues to increase, meaning some hefty expenses associated with this. That may take a little bit of time as well. Yeah, and some smart thinking, I think. And the government has committed to appoint a panel of experts to look at precisely how we get uh, back to balance in terms of the nitty gritty details and what we do beyond 2022 in terms of repaying debt, for example. So I think that panel has a lot of hard work ahead of it, but it's an important job for them to do. Luckily, Alberta does have a lot of options. After 2022, we could begin growing spending again, but keeping it in line with population increases and price increases. So kind of freeze inflation adjusted per person spending. If we maintain that kind of spending restraint for a decade and a half or so after 2022, then that will be enough to plausibly repay all of the debt that we've accumulated up to, up to 2022 by 2040.
So if this massive debt is ever to be completely eliminated, I'm going to guess it'll require maybe a provincial sales tax or serious spending cuts. They're, they're both vote risks. What are the odds of seeing this actually happening after the next election? So that's another part of the coin, right? We don't need to address our fiscal challenges just on the spending side. Certainly we can, and there are options there, but we can also think about new revenues. So Alberta's in this unique position where we have an above average level of spending. And so if we just brought spending down to BC, Ontario, or Quebec levels, then we wouldn't have a deficit right now. And we'd be saving about $10 billion per year in total spending. But if we had average levels of taxation, uh, we would also not have a deficit and we would raise uh, about 10 billion or so if we moved just to BC, Saskatchewan levels, the next two lowest tax provinces. So I think we do need to start having a conversation uh, over the next couple of years about what's the right mix between revenue measures and spending measures. Certainly this matters in the long term because of an aging population and so on. We could look to our neighbors, to Saskatchewan, for example. So Brad Wall's budget prior to him departing as premier tackled, successfully tackled their fiscal challenges through a roughly even split between spending restraint and increasing their sales tax. You know, it's interesting, too, the last provincial election and on the campaign trail, David Kahn, the Alberta Liberal leader, was talking about a, a PST, which didn't resonate with Albertans. But then he also mentioned about the first 57000 and change wasn't going to be taxed on your income. So he says that'll kind of offset it. What are your thoughts for something like that actually happening for there Alberta? Yeah, and that was an interesting proposal based largely off of uh, work by my colleague here, Professor Jack Mintz, who's a leading uh, public finance economist in Canada. So he laid out in 2013 a plan for Alberta to adopt a sales tax, not as a tax increase, but as a pure tax shift. So we would lower income taxes on corporations and on individuals dramatically. We would increase the personal exemption uh, to well over $50,000 so that you wouldn't pay a cent of income taxes if you earned less than that, which would mean a couple could earn well over 100000 in income before they paid any income taxes. But to make up for that lost revenue, we would introduce an 8% uh, sales tax in Alberta, which would bring us in line with Ontario, for example. That would be perfectly revenue neutral from the point of view of the government and would have the added bonus of raising revenue from visitors to Alberta. So roughly 10% of sales taxes paid in Alberta um, would be paid by visitors people coming into Banff and Jasper, for example, or visiting Calgary, Edmonton, or any of the outlying communities. So we wouldn't see a tax on like your home heating costs, for instance. I mean, that's something that uh, federal Tory leader Andrew Scheer says he wants to eliminate the GST portion. It's more like you said, tourists and people want to buy boats, maybe some of the luxury items. Yeah, so, so that's one feature of uh, that, or that's something that makes the sales tax debate kind of interesting. You know, what products does it cover? And we don't pay the GST on everything. We don't pay it on produce at the grocery store, for example, but we do pay it on a bag of potato chips, for example. So governments do pick and choose what it covers and what it doesn't. And so Alberta would need to think about that. One option, uh, in particular, the liberal plan that you mentioned uh, during the campaign was to adopt what's called a harmonized sales tax, where we, sim we don't introduce our own sales tax. We simply ask the federal government to raise the GST in Alberta from five to something higher. And that would mean the provincial government wouldn't really have the ability to exempt some items or another. It would just ratchet up the GST rate. So if spending cuts were to be implemented, any thoughts on which areas to start with? Well, health by far is the largest ministry in government and soon will approach half of overall program spending in the province. And so any kind of measures that look to restrain the growth of spending are going to need to take a serious look at health. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean cuts. I mean, Alberta per person spends a lot more on health than any other province in the country. And we spend a lot more despite the fact that we have by far the youngest population, which should mean we spend less on health than, than average. So I think taking a hard look at how healthcare is done can yield some 
uh, medium and longer term fiscal benefits by ensuring that health costs don't just keep growing at the pace that they have been. Is it a matter of maybe reallocating some of the money in the healthcare service industry too? Because I'm thinking here in Lethbridge, we don't even have a cath lab. We only have one cardiologist. So our healthcare needs are not being met. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so, so this gets into a lot of detail where I guess my expertise is fairly limited, but I think you're right. The allocation of dollars across activities matters a lot and not even just within the Ministry of Health. But think about other kinds of programs that the government does in terms of housing support or, or mental health initiatives or, or, or income support for low income families, for example. These type of programs also have implication for health care costs. Um, and so thinking about how we um, ensure a healthy population may involve a conversation uh, beyond just how we deliver health care within the Ministry of Health. Now, the promised cuts to the corporate tax rate will be phased in over a four-year period of time. What's your take on this? Will it actually be helpful as the UCP made it out to be? Yeah, so I tend to support that uh, tax change. It will have revenue implications for the government, as we mentioned, but bringing the corporate income tax rate down from 12 to 8 will mean that investors will keep a larger return to any investment that they make. And so that increases the return to investing in the province. And that should therefore lead to an increase in investment levels, demand for labor, employment and wages. And so there's some good research to suggest that that is indeed the case. And in general, income taxes, such as corporate income taxes, do tend to distort economic activity more than taxes like sales taxes that we mentioned before. So I do tend to support that reduction in the corporate rate. How about getting a pipeline built, whether it's the Transmont Pipeline Expansion or Energy East? How much will that really help our economy here in Alberta? So that matters a lot. So pipelines are critical to oil and gas for the very simple reason that they allow producers here to ship oil to customers elsewhere at a far lower cost per barrel than rail or other modes of transportation. So pipelines are a cheap, effective way to transport oil. And what that means is that at the end of the day, producers here keep a larger share of the value of the barrel of oil that they sell elsewhere because they don't need to deduct a large transportation cost. So that increases returns to investing in oil and gas here will mean larger investment, more labor demand. But importantly, it also means government revenue will be higher because royalties are a function of the price and the revenue of producers here. So these pipeline constraints, and as we saw late last year, large oil price differences between what we get and the world price, these matter a lot. Um, and, and the revenue implications are huge. So each dollar change in the price of oil uh, for the Alberta government is well over a quarter of a billion dollars per year in revenue. So it, it doesn't take much to have a big impact on the budget. You know, Alberta has always been very reliant on oil and gas. We often hear that we need to diversify our economy a little bit. But what would that actually look like, big picture? Is it more investing into green energy, perhaps? Great question. That comes up a lot, especially during tough economic times in Alberta. Historically, we saw in the 80s a lot of discussion around diversification initiatives, and we're hearing a lot more of that now. I, I tend to look at that a little bit differently than what we hear from politicians and government typically. Our economy itself doesn't really have a diversification problem. If you look at where the jobs are and how they are distributed across sectors in Alberta, we don't look that different from other jurisdictions elsewhere. Uh, what makes us different is where we get our income from. So a larger share of Alberta income, corporate profits, labor income, government revenue, and so on, is concentrated in oil and gas. So we are not diverse in terms of our income sources. And, and to some extent, that's not a big public policy challenge. Corporation uh, you know, the volatility of corporate profits, that's an issue that investors can diversify within their own portfolios. It's not really a government problem or a public policy problem. Government, though, can change the way that it raises its revenue. We are reliant on resource revenues to balance the books. We need roughly one out of every $5 in government revenue to come from royalties on oil and gas. And 
that means our budget is much riskier than elsewhere. And so if we want to tackle our real diversification problem in Alberta, then we need to talk seriously about getting off the royalty roller coaster. And unfortunately, that's a hard conversation to have because it does involve either more spending restraint or increased tax revenues, neither of which in the short term is politically palatable. Dr. Trevor Toome, Associate Professor of Economics at the University of Calgary, thanks a lot for your time today. My pleasure, thank you. And behalf of all of us here at BCN, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless and have a great night.